Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. I'd like to discuss this head CT with you. This is an 86 year old male who had sudden difficulty with walking and mentation problems. So I'll give you a chance to peruse this study and then we'll dig into it. Okay. Okay, so typically hypertension gives hemorrhage in the basal ganglia. In the caudate, see how well, caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus. Caudate, putamen, globus pallidus is back here. Caudate, and they're not really well depicted here. Here is the length of the caudate nucleus, which tapers and parallels the borders of the lateral ventricles bilaterally. And then here's the head of the caudate nucleus on both sides. I would say that this one is nicely seen. This one seems to have either an associated chronic infarct or the white matter chronic changes, which I believe are just chronic changes, have uh, extended into the caudate region that seems less likely. Caudate putamen is kind of a triangular structure here with with kind of a convex border laterally. So caudate putamen globus pallidus is the threesome of the basal ganglia that we often refer to. Okay now let's see how are we going to describe the abnormality remember again you want to have a succinct but accurate statement and then maybe a second or third succinct and accurate statement after that so I would say that this that there is a large hemorrhage in the right cerebellar hemisphere that's a certainty we can say that for sure and I would say that there is substantial mass effect with specifically, see how there's mass effect on this area? These are the colliculi. This is the midbrain right in this area here. And the colliculi, the superior colliculi, and then the inferior colliculi are in this area. Superior colliculi related to vision and inferior colliculi related to audition which is hearing and you can see there's a little bit of compression of the one of the colliculi on the right and I believe that's the inferior colliculus which tends to be bigger and you can see there's deformity of the brain stem inferior to that but it's still probably the midbrain area. Okay. Uh, the other things we see is we see low attenuation in the hemispheres. And an 86 year old, I wouldn't be surprised to see this as a matter of chronic white matter changes that evolve throughout the later years of our life and are of debated significance, but importantly when you see findings like this these low attenuation changes without mass effect without any kind of impression upon the adjacent cortical sulci no deformity of the lateral ventricles you generally would think of it as chronic white matter changes you can see that some of these areas of low attenuation extend into the caudate nucleus and they are probably distinct because white matter chronic changes are not the same pathophysiology as focal infarcts of the caudate nucleus. So I think these are a couple of adjacent caudate nuclei infarcts. Uh, on the left, you have a pretty good view of a caudate nucleus here. This is a deep white matter infarct, or so I would characterize it deep left frontal lobe white matter infarct. You have the lateral ventricles. These are the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. 
here you have it looks like uh, it looks like it's an infarct here right next to the lateral ventricle the only other thing it could be is a perivascular space but that shouldn't communicate with the lateral ventricle so perivascular spaces the, the potential space around blood vessels coursing through the brain can sometimes enlarge and actually can get really quite big. I don't think I've posted a case of that, but I will look for it. So I think we have a large cerebellar hemispheric infarction with midbrain compression. You see, you say statements like that that are clear cut and you don't commit yourself any more than you have to. And that's the best way to discuss a case like this, in my opinion, or any case. Find the, the true statements that you can utter with confidence and lay them out there, separate them with a period at, each en at the end of each statement, and that will impress your mentors. Okay, so look at the ventricular system. It looks a little big to me, and I'm debating here. I would certainly not be surprised if a hemorrhage with this much, much mass effect and deformity of the midbrain certainly could be impressing on the cerebral aqueduct and causing obstruction of the ventricular system which would produce dilatation of the lateral ventricles as well as the third. Uh, but against that, the cortical sulci don't look effaced and the white matter low attenuation is not uniform around the ventricles as you'd expect from the transependymal flow of CSF from obstruction when you have an obstruction such as you might hear that's obstructing the cerebral aqueduct then you get back pressure in the third ventricle and lateral ventricles which cause the third and lateral ventricles to bulge and be more distended with fluid. The chronic white matter changes here uh, look pretty typical for those and unlike the fairly uniform pattern you get with transependymal flow, the ependyma is the lining of the lateral ventricles so if there's obstruction you can get transependymal flow of CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, in the ventricles into the adjacent brain but that tends to have a more uniform look. So this I'd say is moderate chronic white matter changes in an 86 year old male, a large, however, three centimeter, four centimeter hemorrhage in the right cerebellar hemisphere with associated mass effect. And let's see if we can see that that cerebral aqueduct is, is being spared. Here's the lateral ventricle Right and, uh, right and left lateral ventricle. Foramen of Monroe on each side empties into the third ventricle and then the cerebral aqueduct empties from the third ventricle back to the fourth ventricle. Let's see if we can follow that. Now I'm going down so here you can see it kind of squeaking through here and then you go down one cut. Come on. Okay and here I think it's right here and this is the quadrigeminal region, the, the superior and inferior colliculi it are often collectively referred to as the quadrigeminal plate and the overlying fluid CSF filled space is, is the quadrigeminal cistern. So there's effacement of the quadrigeminal cistern and I think this is the cerebral aqueduct there and that looks patent. It's being compressed and uh, compromised, but if we follow that down, it may be some little thin structure here, which is related to the midbrain. Uh, and you can see that the fourth ventricle, which is very compressed, still has some CSF in it, but it's displaced over to the side. So I think what might have spared this person obstructive hydrocephalus is the fact that since this is a lateralized, oops, since this is a lateralized finding on the right side, it's pushed 
the fourth ventricle and probably the cerebral aqueduct to the right rather than just frankly compressing it. Okay, in terms of the anatomy here, we have some nice anatomy because of the arteries, even though there's no contrast here, are very well depicted and you can see the two basilar arteries faintly. You can see them here clearly and this would be the the level of the foramen magnum where the cervical spinal cord transitions to the medulla but since we're into the cranial vault here we're really at the lowermost level of the medulla and these little things here that you see on the right side here and better on the left side here are the cerebellar tonsils they're not tonsils at all but they have a pendulous quality like tonsils and they hang down toward and sometimes through foramen magnum a brilliant brilliant Latin phrase foramen magnum which means big hole and you can also see the two vertebral arteries going up here and merging to form the basilar artery which is here right here and as you follow the basilar artery up it's in the prepontine cistern the cisterns are just areas of CSF that are not in the ventricles basically and so they uh, they provide names so we can describe these spaces and this helps us communicate our findings in better detail. Here we have the cella tersica. So what do we have on both sides? Well, the cella tersica is between the carotid siphons and the cavernous sinuses. The cavernous sinuses are located on each side of the cella tersica. This is the cella tersica. You have bone behind it and there's also bone in front of it. Here you can see the fully barricaded cella tersica with bone in front and behind and so this soft tissue here that's a little higher density would be where the cavernous internal carotid artery flows and it has that squiggly configuration so that it's called carotid siphon and the cavernous sinuses are called that because they are cavernous meaning they hold not only that carotid siphon the internal carotid artery segment that is called the carotid siphon but also cranial nerves 3, 4, V1 which is trigeminal nerve branch 1 and 6. So nice case of well not a nice case. So a cerebellar hemorrhage with mass effect and, and shift of the posterior fossa structures a little to the left and chronic white matter changes with small lacunar infarcts, lake-like lacunar infarcts in at least the left basal ganglia. That's it.